It's the 50th anniversary of Linebacker. Uh, Ken Burns, and you're participating in the uh, documentary about the Vietnam War. Uh, you participated in the conflict. Was it worth it? The, um, it's a mixed picture. Uh, if you ask me about the Christmas bombing, I don't think it was worth it. Uh, we lost B-52s at uh, a rate which would make you think we were trying to get rid of used airplanes. We killed a lot of people on the ground, civilians who we weren't angry with. And we probably got the same deal from the North Vietnamese in negotiations that we would have gotten six months earlier. I can't tell the difference in the deal we got that Kissinger you know, made such a big deal out of than the one that was, we had in our pocket earlier in uh, Paris negotiations before that. So, um, and the whole war was sort of like that. You kind of wonder. And I knew it at the time. I mean, it was obvious to me that the, the uh, Saigon regime was corrupt. Uh, we knew it. Their own people knew it. They were a very unpopular government. And we, were fight we intervened in a, what essentially, in many ways, it was a civil war. One thing, when you pick a, uh, get in somebody else's fight, you got to pick the right side, you know? And it wasn't clear to me that we picked the right side there. Uh, not saying that the North, the, the Hanoi regime was, uh, you know, uh, sort of Denmark in, uh, in Asia. It wasn't. It was an oppressive uh, communist uh, uh, disaster in many ways for its own people. But I can't say that the Saigon government was much to uh, brag about either. And our Long involvement there, and our loss of 58,000 people or so, whose names are on the memorial today, including friends of mine, and the, and the billions that we spent on that effort. It's not clear to me that uh, it was a sensible this thing to do at the time. And since then, now they're our best friends. I mean, the Vietnamese love Americans. They want us there. They want, of course they do, because they see China as a threat and they want us to balance. So uh, it's, it's, at the end of the day, I wonder if our political leadership at the time was, uh, was very smart. Let me fast forward to the uh, um, end of the Cold War, but it coincided with the start of the Gulf War. Um, you were, um, your predecessor was fired uh, by the defense secretary, uh, unfortunately, uh, and you became chief of staff of the Air Force rather abruptly. Um, talk to us about this, you know, folks now look at 27 years since that the U.S. Air Force has been in incessant, at least combat operations on a daily basis. Uh, but what was that mobilization like? What were all the factors that went into it? Um, what were some of the challenges of putting everything together? Um, I'm honored to call Dave Deptula a friend and, and some of the others who planned it. Chuck Horner, uh, it was an honor to cover him as well. He was a, a, a central figure in that on the operational side. But you as the organizing force, as the chief of staff of the Air Force, what were some of the challenges to put together that much hardware so quickly to deliver on a pretty sophisticated plan? Well, it wasn't uh, dead easy, but the Air Force is inherently a deployable force, uh, much more so than uh, even the Marines. I mean, they, they try to configure themselves in peacetime for deployability, and they're aboard these uh, jump jet uh, amphibious carriers and so forth, so they're organized that way, but so are we. We are inherently expeditionary. I mean, we've got our own transportation sitting right out the door, right? We walk out the flight line, get in, we can go anywhere. So, and we, d we work at it. We, we practice it. Uh, uh, you know, we have operational readiness inspections that grade how good we are at doing it. And we work at it all the time. So, uh, I thought that it, it wasn't automatic. I, I monitored it all the time, but it was... 
And before, uh, during Desert Shield, when I was in command out in the Pacific, some of the forces actually moved to the Pacific, especially the uh, B-52s uh, en route to uh, Diego Garcia flew through Guam. And some of my units uh, went forward, uh, the uh, Wild Weasel guys from uh, Clark and so forth. So I had, I, uh, had some experience out in the Pacific in supporting the logistics movement of, of forces through my theater. It wasn't a very big problem for me because of the good work done by other people. What was a bit of a problem was the politics here in Washington. Uh, the uh, Everybody in the JCS, from Colin Powell on down, was a Vietnam War veteran. And we were all determined not to repeat the mistakes of Vietnam. And so maybe we made the mistake of overcorrecting. I went to Powell at one point and said, hey, I mean, the deployment started in August. And uh, we were coming up to a January kickoff date. And the Army still wasn't ready to go, by the way. It wa wanted to delay some more. I said, hey, we've been doing push-ups out there for six months. You know, I mean, the concern here is that we got this relatively uh, small war to, to fight, and we're making it look like hard work. Uh, I mean, uh, to, to talk, to be the air power advocate at a time when the, the JCS was dominated by uh, talks about decisiveness and ground forces b being uh, uh, employed simultaneously and so forth. That was the hard part. I finally said, look, I'm, I, luckily I went over to Saudi Arabia and flew seven sorties in the F-15 in January uh, and then got back in time for the January 17th kickoff. But I, was, I went over and assessed this and I had uh, the president invited me over to the White House and we sat down and had lunch. And he said, uh, you know, are you ready to go? I said, we've been ready to go for some time because even at that point, there was talk of delay from January into February so that we could all jump in together. Look, the 8th Air Force didn't wait till D-Day in 1946 in order to stop start bombing Germany. We opened a second front in the air in 1942-43. So my point was, the Air Force is ready to go. Let's start air operations. And when the Army's ready to join in, they can jump right in. So we had 39 days, and the president agreed, by the way. President Bush, he said, don't worry about it. We weren't going to delay, which made me feel pretty good. Uh, so we had 39 days of, air, of the air operation. And by that time, uh, when the Army was ready and G-Day uh, uh, occurred, we had four days of, of relatively easy ground operations because we had hammered the Iraqi forces you know, until they were ready to give up. They started surrendering. In fact, we had a bunch of them surrender before G-Day. I forget, 100,000 guys or something came across a wire before the Army intervened. They, they just queued up to surrender. So uh, the, the, to give that, to present that, that point, that we don't have to wait. You know, we could go. There, there is a, a case here for independent air operations. That was a political problem, and it was probably the, you know, the, pro the hardest problem to work in Washington during that time, especially because I was a new guy. You know, nobody knew whether I knew what I was talking about or not. It's kind of a small unit operation deal. They had to say, this is, in fact, President George H.W. Bush uh, tells the story all the time. We went up to Camp David to, uh, around Christmas time, to the, the chiefs went up there to, to brief the president and his senior team. Uh, Jim Baker was up there. Uh, uh, Brent Scrocroft, who was a national security advisor, everybody. And so I made some, some predictions about what we were going to do on the air side that turned out to be pretty, pretty good. Uh, and uh, the president took Brent Scrocroft aside the, and at the end and said, hey, this guy McPeak, does he know what he's talking about? So uh, that, that's the small unit dynamics in action when you get that 
small group in a table around a table, and he didn't know me. Uh, I hadn't met him until then, and he wanted to know if I was trustworthy and if I knew my job. That's that's a small unit test. I passed. The only mistake I made was I told him we'd have a couple hundred airplanes shot down. And uh, but I deliberately exaggerated that because I didn't want to under you know, over-promise and under-deliver. And I wanted him to be ready for, you know, our guys walking around on the ground with their hands in the air, POWs. Uh, was wildly wrong there, thank goodness. We didn't have anything, not, it was a different order of magnitude as far as our losses went, but, uh, so I told a lie there, but it was deliberate on my part because I wanted to make sure he was prepared for as bad a news as he could get. Um, it's worth pointing out at this point that General Scowcroft is a retired three-star Air Force Fighter general. <laughs> F-86 guy. And uh, so, yeah, he and I uh, spoke the same language, and he told the president, yeah, I think McPeak probably knows what he's talking about. <laughs>